Final Fantasy Discourse is in a really dumb spot right now due to some intentionally bad actors making it even dumber than normal. That isn't to say it isn't valid if you aren't enjoying yourself right now, but there's a level of hyperbole and nostalgia that is muddying things, whether people want to admit it or not. Criticism is always an art form, and not all art is well made. It's all valid on some level, but a lot can be less healthy or less well put together. It gets even worse when outrage merchants are making bad art. One of my main criticisms with the game is the community and their lack of properly being able to constructively criticize or have any nuance, even without outrage merchants trying to profit. A job being weaker is automatically a job being complete garbage and calls for Yoshi P to be called the worst director ever. Then when the people who actually took time to properly voice their complaints and are heard, people get angry because those people actually made real effort instead of screaming into the void. Of course, that doesn't apply to everyone. There are plenty of people who have genuine complaints and real reasons and do want to have real conversations about it. But even some of those people I feel like either don't have the hindsight that kind of shows Endwalker isn't nearly as bad as the worst expansion, or literally forgot. It's almost at the level I could call them liars and move on without feeling like I was being unfair. Anyone who has spent enough time around me knows I'm not entirely afraid to share my opinions. So you would think that if Endwalker was that bad, I would have no problems joining in to say Endwalker is the worst expansion. But I don't have that criticism. At worst, Endwalker is, as the kids would say, just mid. The content we get is fun, jobs are generally balanced, and many other points that are positives for the game. The complaints, meanwhile, tend to be extremely fringe and don't apply to 90% of the player base. But what if Endwalker was so bad that they removed half the content during it, balance was seen as non-existent, with some jobs being called outright unviable, and rating didn't just have one fight that had 1-2% to too much HP, but was instead gated by several weeks of gear and nearly killed rating entirely. People would have a field day. You think the discourse is bad now? Imagine if that was Endwalker. So let's talk about that a little bit, and maybe give people some missing and forgotten perspective. Let's talk about the critically acclaimed MMORPG Final Fantasy XIV with an expanded free trial, which you can play through the entirety of A Realm Reborn and the award-winning Worst Expansion Heavensward, up to level 60 for free, with no restrictions on playtime. And as a warning, there will be some massive spoilers for the game. Unfortunately, some topics require me to be spoilery. Yeah, that's right. The worst expansion in Final Fantasy XIV is Heavensward. So many people have joined this game hearing the meme and so much praise for the expansion, but anyone who is there knows it was far from the beacon of purity it is now. At best, it is second worst next to the base game. For as I've heard, earlier Realm Reborn had 100 to 200 milliseconds of built-in lag, Warrior literally was unplayable in raiding to start, and many other issues. This isn't a video made to specifically be a takedown of Heavensward, though in a way it is, because despite being part of that oh-so-famous meme, people remember Heavensward for something it wasn't. I'm not here to tell you you're wrong for liking the expansion, but when it comes to what the game has done wrong, huge swaths of it are being ignored for the high highs, or even what Heavensward is as of today, rather than what it was when it came out. This will be some needed context, for many people who did not get to experience this. Heavensward was officially released on June 23rd, 2015. People were impressed with the storytelling and fondly remember it to this day. But when people say Heavensward is as good as it is, I think this is all they remember. Because almost immediately the expansion was plagued with troubles and criticisms. Starting off, you know how we have a patch cycle of four months now? Due to the game being so big and all now. Well, back when the expansion launched, we got a taste of this. Yoshi P did the most evil thing in the world. He's so terrible a person. You should all unsub right now because he sucks so bad. He gave the dev team a vacation. Yeah, really. People got angry about it. It might have been just a very small minority, but at the time there was a noticeable reaction to this dastardly, evil plot to not overwork the dev team. The raid tier was delayed, I believe, and later Patch 3.1 ended up releasing November 10th the same year. So it's not even a significant delay. So yeah, not really a mark against Heavensward, just people being dumb that kind of soured the mood at the time. If community or people is a complaint anyone has and genuinely puts it against Endwalker, well, you better put way more against Heavensward. My god. We could talk about balance and opinions on that, but ultimately things shifted to a very rigid meta of 
Dragoon, Ninja, Bard, and Machinist. It wasn't even close. What with Trick Attack being at its most loved, and Dragoons giving a passive damage boost to both the Bard and the Machinist was a disembowel. It used to increase all piercing damage on a target, which means the ranged jobs got to benefit. By this point, the opinions on Astrologian came around as well. Seen as weak at launch from everyone I talked to, it got so many different adjustments every patch, more than any of the other jobs. Well, aside from maybe Bard. Some people greatly miss Bowmage, many others despised it, myself included. It wasn't even like it was a job rework. 1 to 50 played the same as it did before Heaven's Word. It's just you had to bow mage in Heaven's Word. Quick tangent, people complain about jobs losing their identity in Endwalker, but nothing compares to a Realm Reborn Bard into Heaven's Word Bard. The playstyle shift is about as extreme as Old Summoner to Endwalker Summoner, but again, that's without the full rework that gives Summoner a consistent identity from 1 to 90. Summoner is a physical ranged, even people who like Bow Mage call it Bow Mage. And when there's five fewer jobs to play as, your options for begrudgingly changing your main were fewer. And Machinist was a Gun Mage. That one is fine because it's a brand new job, but come on. Anyway, back to the balance talk. Casual groups still really never needed to care about balance, but they did. Even in Stormblood, when balance had been improved, Samurai was often excluded from even extreme level content. Combine this with the same player base that invented Skip Sword or Disband, and you get a recipe for the meta being mirrored even where it isn't needed. Which it wasn't even needed in Alexander Creator Savage either. That was mostly for speedruns, but I even saw groups forcing the meta for animal weapon farms. While we had some true imbalances and problems, perceived imbalances made things worse and worse. Look back at the intro for this video. This is what I mean with weaker being perceived as trash. While much of the discussion is a community issue, it stems from genuine problems the balance of the game had. For as intense as the conversations around balance are now, it was worse back then, plaguing even the casual scene more than it does today. Rather than taking word as gospel, take it with a grain of salt. When Zeno goes on a rant about tanks, Hi Zeno, you might have been told to react to this because it's in vogue right now and I get it, gotta pay the bills. Don't just blindly believe him, even when he's right. A tiny bit of skepticism will go a long way to getting you to understand the criticism way more, get you involved in the conversation, and perhaps even actually be able to give constructive and actionable criticism too. Rather than aimless anger and no way for them to fix it, because they don't know what fixing it means to you. Again, this isn't also to say everyone is blinding agreeing with him or such, but I've been seeing it happen over and over since I joined the game. Hell, I can guarantee I was part of it but I took time to learn the game, learn myself, and actually be able to agree with things on an honest level instead of mindless parroting. I often disagree. Hell, this entire video is almost a takedown of Heaven's Word as an expansion just to prove a point. And you know there's going to be dozens of comments who never make it past me calling it the worst. But I can absolutely say I'm much more learned and informed than I was back in the day, which I could probably end the video there with showcasing my point. Actually put effort into your criticism. Don't just parrot what a guy said without understanding what he said. But the part of the point was also how short-sighted people are. They forget their history and see the forest for the trees. Speaking of job balance, stat balance. Do you remember what direct hit was? How it didn't exist back in Heaven's Word? Did you even know direct hit wasn't always there? Do you remember the numbers, Mason? Because direct hit used to be accuracy, a stat I don't know anyone really misses. If you missed it, please do tell me why, because in practice it was no better to me. Accuracy does what you expect, increases your accuracy up to a 100% guaranteed hit. Front, flank, rear, and casters all were different thresholds. Casters would stop at the caster cap, while everyone else would need to stack upwards of 700 accuracy to be able to hit stuff in the Savage Tears final fight. It was kind of just something you had to do, purely an obligation. Arguably, Direct Hit is a more boring stat, just a further option for doing more damage. It also increased the level of RNG for parsing at the very high end, but like, come on, that's just nitpicking at that point. But is it really all that any better to have a stat you pretend doesn't exist past the required minimum? Where the game has no in-game way to see what amount you needed? People needed to put on the gear and just test. Luckily, Stone Sky Sea started this expansion so they could use the striking dummies, but it needed to be tested manually, and this would be needed for every new tier if they kept the system. Because while something like 
crafting numbers have been pretty consistent with being able to assume breakpoints beforehand, there's no way to know for sure until it has been tested. And with how most everyone just grabs one of the agreed best in slot gear sets, being able to see multiple types of crits is probably more fun to everyone, huh? Number go up is enjoyable. But that's less specific than something like Black Mage and the racial bonuses. Back in Heaven's Word, stat numbers were so much lower, so one or two extra stats in something did mean way more than it does now. On top of this, Piety was actually a max MP boost. We didn't have 10,000 flat MP at all times. Skill cost also scaled with your level, so if Fire took about 10% MP at level 50, it would still take about that at level 60 due to how much it was set to cost at both levels. So stacking Piety could theoretically give you extra casts of Fire or such. If you were a Lalafell Black Mage, you didn't have to worry. You had that racial stat bonus to keep you going. Everyone who didn't have the Piety Threshold needed to meld a Piety Materia or play a bit differently. The common rotation at the time only worked at that specific MP level, meaning those very few racial stats would lose you a Fire 4 or put you into a position where you didn't have enough MP to cast Blizzard 3 to start the Umbral phase. I don't recall this being an issue for level 50 content, so it even is an issue exclusive to Heaven's Word Black Mage. Though, correct me if I'm wrong and misremembering. That's not even the worst of it. There was the constant discourse around tanks and their stats. There have been shifts to what stat tanks used for DPS multiple times over the years. At this point, I believe tanks were completely based on the strength stat. So what would you do if your tank had a significantly lower HP amount because they were wearing Dragoon Rings? Nothing, because that was pretty normal. There's a reason why rings that have the same amount of strength and vit are locked specifically to a roll now, even if there's no tenacity attached. Even Stormblood had its own issues with this until we finally got the roll locked rings and removal of main stat materia. Along the same trend is why we have two meld slots on rings, something that was extremely common and complained about one way or the other. Because your warrior missing a lot of HP for a raid tier already seen as killing the game was just too much. Oh yeah, you remember that? Alexander Gordius was often considered the death of raiding, and could even potentially be traced back to with how people say Ether is the only raiding data center. Complex and hard with the new and different rotations, a trash fight that I don't think anyone liked, I was the gobwalker guy, a final fight most people never saw and was cheesed through, and the most infamous jiggly of them all. People were upset that P8S was 1-2% overtuned. Gordius needed weeks of gearing for most groups, with mechanics that were often seen as extremely finicky and bad. Digititis? More like pingitis. Tethers? More like badthers. Even when you don't factor in those things, the fight was just really hard. Tight DPS check, tight execution, tight healing, it was all just hugely punishing. It's also stuff like this that make me say people were way worse players back in the day. The groups that could clear were already god gamers to we plebeians, but I'm very curious to how things would go if we got an A3S Unreal of sorts, or even just a fight people would compare to A3S. A lot of the doomsaying at the time involved people being worried that the game was going to die as a result of this. The complete collapse of rating is not good for any game, even one with minimal rating to begin with. Obviously, the game has recovered quite spectacularly, but has anyone genuinely said that raiding is dead because of what happened in Pandemonium? I'm sure it didn't help that at the time, a wipe meant waiting up to 7 minutes for the next pool. Cooldowns didn't reset on wipe. If you wiped right after the Paladin used Hollowed Ground, you were waiting for that to come back, or at least to be available when it would be needed. Then you have to wait 54 seconds for the Warrior's Countdown macro. Oh, did you not know about the 54 second long pre-pull opener for Warrior? It was grueling and pointless, but that's a common theme for Heaven's Word. Crafting and gathering was the hardest to get into, even more difficult than it is with 90 levels to go through. While currently people suggest leveling every crafter for the shared materials, back then it was absolutely required to level every crafter. Today you can theoretically just be one crafting class, just buy the materials from the other crafters. Back then, if you didn't level every crafter, you were just outright a bad crafter. This is because of cross-classing. Every crafter had some skills to give to the others, and so many of them obligatory. Every touch and synthesis action had a success rate, so you would need Steady Hand to boost it to 100%. Careful Synthesis was a cross-class. Tricks of the Trade, Manipulation, Byregard's Blessing, Inner Quiet, 
all main tools you use for crafting were all cross-class skills, then the actual progression in crafting was a chore too. The class quests of Heaven's Void required you to have master books to be able to complete them. Getting scripts, newly introduced, was difficult because of needing a baseline of gear, which you wouldn't really be able to do fresh at 60 unless you were already established as a crafter, or had funds to buy decent gear. Then there's the crafts themselves and rotations used. Materials with a high level of difficulty to obtain or a large number needed. If I say the word camphor, I'll give many crafters a PTSD flashback. Then the rotation most commonly used, as far as I had seen, was Maker's Mark, or Mama. What the Mama rotation did at Endgame in Heaven's Word was give you, say, oh, 40 stacks of a buff that decreased one per step, and you would use all 40 of these stacks. While you had that 40 stack of buffs, you could use a skill that cost no durability, no crafting points, but only raised progression by 20 points. You would hit this button over and over and over. Your goal was to hit a specific minimum progression by the end and max out your points from tricks of the trade usage before the quality phase. All in all, a 50 to 60 step process per craft. And remember, this skill had a failure rate. So on a rare chance, you could completely need to change your rotation to make up for missing progress. Infamous and unsustainable, Mama was removed from the game. If it wasn't, it would have become worthless, or given you literally hundreds of stacks to use. Progress at the time capped out at 1000 for things with a high quality version. We are now at more than four times that. There was no choice but to remove it, or entirely change it, which essentially would still be removing it. And I do not miss it. It was not the only rotation, but it was just about the most consistent option. This is where specializations also came in. That buying materials from other crafters to be able to make stuff as, say, just a carpenter? That was required to make the raiding gear in Heaven's Word. Only a leather worker specialist could make the brand new leather the new gear needed. And that applied to the gear itself, too. So the fact that you could only have three specialists was a huge sticking point. Nowadays, this system might not be completely awful. Levels aside, the barrier for entry is much lower. Script gear is easy to farm with things like custom deliveries being so numerous, and so much else making things far more bearable. It could inject new life into the crafting system, but also it could equally destroy the entire economy. So let's maybe not. But at the time, this received huge backlash and is why the system basically does nothing now. Specialists can craft current patch music and furniture from extreme drops and... That's about it. An abandoned system because it received such harsh criticism. The gathering side was equally contentious. To the point of not just abandoning a system, but outright removing it. Who remembers the favor system? You could spend scripts on essentially leave tokens to start a gathering leave in a specific location. You had about five minutes to gather as much as you could. You needed these resources for... something. I honestly forget. But again, this was a disliked system, and they have since removed it. However, this one? I would definitely say it is time to give a second chance. This was actually a good idea that was too early. To repeat myself, at the time, getting to 60 was difficult, getting gear was difficult, and establishing yourself was far from simple. I think at the end of the expansion, making the leap into an on-content crafter cost me 20 mil. This was the only real way in, since scripts were so rare and Zoloi wouldn't be added until 3.55. That much is a win for Heaven's Wood 2. Custom deliveries make getting into the system so much easier. But now, yeah, we have Zoloi and Kurenai and everyone else. At the absolute worst, you can overlevel into Stormblood gear, go back to Zoloi, and start amassing a script base to buy script gear. You can insert yourself into the gear curve far easier than before, and without any real funding. So something like favors would be far less difficult to get into as well, since you have plenty of leftover scripts. If anything, I feel the main criticisms people have all boil down to the patch formula. People want things to be shaken up, and I think favors, properly tooled and discussed, would be a good way to shake up the gathering side of things. Sure, it boils down to the same thing as always, gathering isn't something you can make all that much more complex, but it's something new. Old.
new. Old and new. But yeah, it was super hard to get into. No Ishgardian firmament and diadem to power level, and costing scripts you could barely obtain. It was a mess and quickly discarded. It's almost a surprise the collectible system as a whole wasn't also removed. This too was a heaven's word thing. Speaking of diadem though, diadem is the only piece of content in the game to be removed from the game not once, but twice. Diadem in the Ishgardian firmament is actually the third attempt at the content. It was hated and failed twice in Heaven's Word. The first two times required you to use free company airships, also added in Heaven's Word, I believe, to get to it. And what you did there was just a watered down version of hunts. You would kill enemies to spawn giant Brachiosaurus enemies, which had the big loot. It also had a gathering component that I never saw anyone talk about. But what was the loot these enemies dropped? Ethereal gear. What is ethereal gear? Well, pink rarity gear. That means it has random substats attached. This can be something good, something bad, a small amount, or a big amount. So doing this content was technically an alternate way of gearing that relied on a level of RNG beyond anything you could imagine in this game. So the drops weren't specific drops. You got coffees that you had to roll on, so you could end up getting nothing through a trip if your rolls were bad enough. Then you open the coffer and one, hope it's gear that your main can use, and two, hope its stats aren't trash. I believe that no matter how good they were, they did not surpass the best in slot from raiding. But if you got really, really lucky, you could get comparable gear from an otherwise extremely mindless task. More mindless than any relic, I would say. The battle side died pretty quick, and I don't know how alive the gathering side was, and so they needed to retool the content, and so they did. Diadem V2 was basically just fate farming to basically the same exact end, ethereal gear. But there was a new aspect to this. There was a chance, chance, for an emergency mission to crop up. This was a signal for everyone in the instance to run to the giant crystal in the middle for a mission. I have never cleared the emergency mission, because you had a significant chance, chance, of there being at least one troll or otherwise jerk who didn't follow any directions or anything because essentially, this was a mini alliance raid kind of thing, but with more people. You had to split up, kill enemies, then kill the big one in the middle. More often than not, you would immediately wipe the moment you zoned in. Someone would pull on purpose, or just be impatient, or whatever. Of the few times I was able to get in, I never saw anything die. Well, I did. Everyone in the duty. Repeatedly. And people wondered why Baldesian Arsenal runs were so insistent on keeping non-pre-made people out. Trusting some rando can be pretty hard when the risks are so high. But if you got the chance, chance, to go in and won the chance, chance, to get a group who could clear, you had a chance, chance, at a weapon coffer with a chance, chance, to be your main and a chance, chance, to have good substats. What item level was this one in a thousand chance, chance, weapon, t t 280, eye level 280, higher than anything else in the expansion, even savage rating. So if you got even a bad substat roll, you probably had a weapon better than rating. People were livid. The narrative I heard repeated many times was that FF logs locked down in a sort of protest of these weapons, but really it was probably at most a split for an even playing field. For whatever your opinions on parsing are, there can be healthy competition within this. This extreme rare chance in a game otherwise not built around this, this isn't Maple Story, is extremely unfair to whatever fair competition could be had. While people are often asking for a level of horizontal progression that FF14 lacks, be it from random chance or anything, I don't think anyone feels that this was it. That the game should go in this direction. This deep into layers of RNG. There can be something to shake up gear progression. Maybe their plans in Dawn Trail of how to better integrate VNC dungeons. But this was not the right call. Once again, Diadem failed, people stopped doing it, and it got removed yet again only to come back in Shadowbringers with the current Gathering-only version. Imagine if Eureka was received this way. Bogia, the big mass-player content of Heavensward, was poorly received twice in a row, 
and removed twice in a row. Something you cannot say in any way for Eureka and Bogia, no matter how much criticism those got. The original diadem maps, I believe, are now just completely gone. The current version is definitely the best received, but Heavensward had to fail twice to get that far. Speaking of maps being poorly received, the areas of Heavensward. People constantly call Azizla the worst map in the game. If it's not there, it's the Sea of Clouds. The Locks is a distant third for what I see people call the worst. But the other maps often aren't seen too positively either. Kurthus Western Highlands isn't too positive. Ishgard itself confuses people. The Tower in the Forelands confuses people too. Churning Mists is Moogles. And Hinterlands? It's just the Zizla again. They're large and have poor Aetherite placement. People also hated the Aether current placements. The worst one is always called that super easy one to get in the locks. The amount of complaints about these maps, they just keep coming anytime a newbie goes through them. And then the vets chime in about hating them too. Or you know, forgotten like training mists. People forget this place so often. Even I do. They also forget Lord of Verminion exists. You know, Lord of Verminion. That, that like, RTS game in the Golden Saucer. Lord of Verminion? No? Well, I don't blame you. But that was Heaven's Word too. I don't know where to put this point that would fit naturally, but uh... The Void Arc? I don't know about you, but anytime I did Void Arc, people would spend the duty saying how much they hated it. Maybe one person might say they thought it was fine or liked it, but they were then quickly drowned out by everyone getting right back to dunking on it. Something I have seen no other raid go through. Crystal Tower is only attacked as much as it is because of fatigue. Void Arc? People didn't like it from day one, and is my undisputed least favorite alliance raid. And now, let's talk about the story. When A Realm Reborn ended, people were extremely excited to see where the story would go. Nanamo was dead, Raubon just committed cold-blooded murder against one of the Monitorists, and the Scions wanted for regicide. Even for as much as the common man would believe in the Scions after what they did, the odds were against us. And then that plot point became a massive disappointment for most people. Nanamo was not dead. Lolorito, not out of the kindness of his own heart, if he even has one, saved her life. Raubon was freed moments before this realization. The Scions all disappearing? Yustola gets plucked from the life stream with permanent loss of eyesight. She now has to see by sensing the ether in the world around her. It's implied that this is slowly draining her life force and is another plot point that gets dropped. Though technically that's not Heaven's Word's fault, but like, was it just meant to be Motoya warning her not to overwork herself? Why did it sound like Yustola is literally dying by the second, more than we all are naturally? Thancred just gets spat out somewhere in Dravania. He did lose his ability to manipulate Aether, which Shadowbringers goes really far into making a really awesome part of his character. So thanks for that, Heaven's Word. Minfilia is in limbo, but with Hydaelyn herself. Like, she's so excited right before she is taken. If anything, this is a good outcome for her. Even if, you know, Thancred dies a couple dozen times inside before this gets fully resolved. Ida and Papalimo? Yeah, they just went somewhere over there, just sitting around with the Alamegans over there. So, some permanent scars, but everyone is technically alive. Even Minfilia and Toreen eats her. So much of a disappointment for people, so much of a backtrack of what happened, people were convinced Papalima was alive after he finally did die to seal Shinryu. We don't see a body, so people were convinced he does not die here. Only now that Endwalker has fully and completely confirmed Papalimo is dead, will people be forced to stop. One of the criticisms of the game as a whole is the developers being afraid to kill people off. Yustola being the face of the game and stuff like Dissidia probably plays a part of why her eyes are no longer something deadly. It's why people were convinced Papalima would come back, no matter how much evidence that he was dead. Nobody else dies unless they are a side character. Nanamo? I kinda give a pass. How hard must it be to write along the direction they wanted to go, with one of your three leaders being dead? Raubon definitely wouldn't just become the leader of the new government Nanamo wished to establish. Even when going home to Alamigo, he remains a general. He's charismatic and smart, but he knows who he is. So like, what would you do? How do you genuinely keep Nanamo dead? 
the patch content of Heavensward would entirely be taken up by this plot point. Even killing Thoridan with him technically having an heir takes up significant plot time in Heavensward patch quests. Figuring out how to progress Ulda is too much on top of that, so you just trick the players into thinking she's dead, even if it leads to some disappointment that they didn't keep to it. This was the first expansion of the fledgling MMO. It really shows. Half of all the things it tried to do ended up failing. Sure, we had successes like Deep Dungeon, but that doesn't erase all the different ways people were disappointed in the course of the expansion. And then they were told to skip so it would disband. It's no wonder one of the issues the game currently has now is taking chances. When they do, people often hate it. Even the two-minute burst of Endwalker could be seen as a risk they took, and that got a level of criticism too. Why take risks if it's going to kill the game? Let's make one last point. Regardless of quality, because let's be real, objectively, the quality of the game remains good. Let's compare the amount of content Endwalker has next to Heavensward. First, we have dungeons. Heavensward has a big list of 18 dungeons, with Endwalker only having 13. That's five less when you don't count V and C dungeons. Add those in and we have 16 dungeons for Endwalker. Two less, but consider that V and C is two, technically three, difficulties. A massive puzzle-based dungeon you're meant to run repeatedly for different paths, fights, and the true ending, and basically a raid. So really, even if we count Varian as just one, despite having five completely unique bosses, Criterion definitely is worth counting as a second dungeon. So we have 19 dungeons. And maybe it's just me, but I tend to see people call doing roulettes as the lowest form of content. More variety in those roulettes is nice, but it's hardly more content. Raids, 12 normal and savage and 3 alliance. Yeah, no difference, until you count Endwalker having two ultimate raids. 13 jobs to 19 jobs and a limited job. This one is less of a measure against each other, and more of a show of how much more Endwalker has due to coming so much later. Endwalker has the content of all previous expansions inside of it. Have you really done all of it? Crafting and gathering. About the same when you account for what didn't work in Heavensward and was removed. But you might also count that Endwalker has three custom deliveries to Heavensward's one. And the fact that ocean fishing gets updates. How about open field content? Despite how many people were very loud about how awful Eureka and Bogia were, those of us who liked that content were disappointed that Endwalker had none of this. Heavensward had instead the Diadem. I, I mean, the, the, the Diadem V2. Oh, uh, yeah. Well, both expansions have a deep dungeon. People like deep dungeons, right? Palace of the Dead is double the size, but not inherently double the enjoyment. Some people prefer the longer length, others prefer 100. I don't think you can really compare the two outright. A deeper dive is needed, no pun intended. You people with nothing to do are necromancers, right? Soloed Palace of the Dead to 200? How about lifestyle content? Endwalker has the new island sanctuary, a fun little diversion, and some decorating for the housing buffs. What was Heavensward's thing? The gathering side of the diadomo. Well, trials. Both have seven trials. Unless you count Unreal. Sure, it's the same exact fight as originally, but with numbers scaled up. But it's probably the closest you can get to experiencing the trials as they were at launch. Massive system overhauls? Heavensward added cross-world party finder. Before we had world visit, data center visit, all that, we had to form all parties in the same world. Sure, Duty Finder was across the whole data center, but Party Finder? Nope. Thank you, Heavensward. Endwalker, meanwhile, has the biggest PvP revamp, new toolkits for all jobs, a new mode, and they've started retooling the frontline maps. Oh, and data center travel. Well, And then, uh, well, that's it? I guess the Alliance Raid had the proto-Ultima weapon fight? Endwalker has the Azura fight that you could fight at FanFest, though they might decide to put that into the game in Dawn Trail, in which case you can scratch that. Oh, Hildebrand! People like the Heavensward parts of Hildy, right? And they like the Endwalker parts. Said Endwalker parts also include a solo duty. On that note, Heavensward had a very grindy relic. 
while the only grind for Heavensward is doing the relatively short Hildebrand questline. That comparison being how long it takes next to how long relics take to do. According to many, grindy relics are bad, so Heavensward Relic is bad, right? I prefer the grindy relic. And as mentioned, Heavensward did add airships for free companies. Not really sure what this could be comparatively to Endwalker, if anything. Oh, and we have maps! Maps are cool and Endwalker has multiple dungeons! So now that's it, right? So what the hell, I thought Endwalker has nothing to do compared to previous expansions. The other best expansion had even less to do. I'm sure you could maybe pick out a couple things here or there I missed in Heavensward, but you could also do the same for Endwalker. And I could also bring up those damn Moogles and their tribal quests being locked behind quests that aren't even marked blue! We can also do the same for Shadowbringers. What that has is Diadem V3 and Bosia, a piece of content widely criticized. I'll say again, the lack of another Eureka-like thing was disappointing for me. But it isn't like there's nothing to do without it. It isn't like that was the only content in the entire game. And Diadem is hardly this complex thing. It's collectibles and basic gathering. Exit crafts are a new feature, but still is not this giant new thing. You need to grind a ton for the Paternodon, but as far as there being content to do, it is extremely little, especially with the Ishgardian Reconstruction being long gone. Even when it was active, it was extremely time sensitive. I only ever got to do like five of the things. Most of them happened at like 3 a.m. Fates are nice to have, but it's still less than what most people might consider content. Even if there's really nothing to do in Endwalker, there was nothing to do in Shadowbringers either. Nothing to do in Heavensward, with half the activities being actively disdained and even removed. If it is bad now, it was always bad. You just are in denial at some point. Like, one person even said, what am I gonna do? Fishing? Seriously? Have you not heard about Here to Fish and Mahjong? The person who is here to fish and Mahjong? But like, I don't want to be all negative, because pointing out the positives is a major, major part of what makes something good criticism. At least when they do exist. I can hands down no question say without any doubt that I find Heaven's Word is the worst Final Fantasy XIV has ever been. But then why can I also say at the same time that Heavenswood has my absolute favorite pieces of content in the entire game? My favorite trials? My favorite dungeon? My favorite alliance raid? Yes, in the same expansion as my least favorite raid of Void Arc is my most favorite raid in Dunscathe. Heavensward is so praised because of its extremely high highs, often making people forget the extremely low lows but it would be unfair if I didn't also talk about those high highs. I am working on a dedicated video for this part, but I need to mention it here. With the release of 3.1, we got the release of The Minstrel's Ballad, Thornton's Reign, a fight where you truly feel at a disadvantage, fighting the entire Heaven's Ward, where even your party of eight is the smaller force. And it's just amazing, and by far the single best trial the game has ever had. When I am disappointed by a trial, it's in comparison to Thordin, and then probably Ravana in second. There is a high that fight gives me that nothing else has, even Dragon Song Reprise Ultimate. Yes, even Death of the Heavens in Drew doesn't give me the same feeling as doing Thordin Extreme does, and I like Drew. I never cleared unfortunately, but I want to remedy that, since I was at Roth Flames. But even an ultimate doesn't replicate the feelings I have, and still have, for that fight. Again, I'm cutting it short because I will have a whole video just for that, but Heavensward gave me a fight that I don't think will ever be beaten in my eyes. It gave me the best alliance raid too. Dunscathe is a fair level of difficulty, I'd say. It has a good variety in its mechanics, and Diabolos is such an amazing final boss. For as absolutely terrifying Phase 2 is, he gives you a checkpoint when he inevitably destroys the Alliance. People freak out so hard when they see they're doing zero damage for so long because the stone skin is so beefy. The whole duty is just such a fun time, so varied and definitely is what all other Alliance raids get compared to for me. Then the dungeon that is the Fractal Continuum. Three very different bosses that all were fun to fight, actually fun trash pools, and just such a fun time in general. Though this was also the patch that had Never Reap, 
the worst dungeon in the entire game. So uh, maybe a little bit of bias due to that. But I do still love Fractal for itself. It is super fun. And then for what the story did with disappointing me, it gave me one of my absolutely favorite moments in the entire game. This entire scene with the late Stephen Critchlow is just pure perfection on the tone and delivery. Even as the Scions celebrated the return of a long-lost friend, honorable men plotted to deprive them of another. Honorable men, to whom Sir Emmerich was no hero, but a scheming patricide. Honorable men, who would fain wash the paving stones of foundation with the tyrant's blood. Honorable men, whose knife in the dark was the spark which set the city aflame and who sang as it burned. It gives me chills every time. This is the cutscene from the quest Dreams of the Lost, if you wish to rewatch it for yourself. It's just so damn good. And of course there's the Warriors of Darkness being introduced, everything through Baelsar's Wall, and of course Horshafond. There are some absolutely amazing moments in this expansion story, including more subdued ones like the relationship between Istinian and Alphano. For all the moments that went sour, moments like this are why we love this game, why we keep coming back. They make us care, and then rip out our hearts for both good and ill. Then at the end of the ride that is the story, we can do some dungeons, raids, and trials. And Endwalker had lots of these too. It had some very huge highs. In From the Cold made me feel genuinely sick with fear. I feared again when Matsya's life was threatened during the final days. Yet again when we watched Medion turn. But between them all, time to decompress, to recover, only for the game to slap me back down with another moment of excitement, fear, or sadness. All of Ultima Thule, that finale, to say any of the missteps the story did have make these amazing moments not exist, it's just too much. You don't have to like these moments, but recognize that so many people do. What people probably mostly are down about is the patch quests. Our little adventure was a bit too feeling of a fillet arc for most. We got some extremely huge implications through this one, but that's threads we won't see the results of for an expansion or two. After all, as they said at the EU FanFest, we've already seen most of Hydaelyn. We can't stay on this planet forever. We're gonna need to check out the other shards. But anyway, it felt like a filler arc. Was slow, didn't do much overall, and doesn't lead to Dawn Trail at all. It will probably be the whole reason why we go to Mericidia in 8.0, and connect us to the other shards, where we'll finally lose Yishtola so she can settle down with Runar. But again, the level of pull these patches had was just... lower. At least seems to be the general feeling. It was very middling, but how do you really do much more while still establishing what they needed to? Perhaps you could say that a middling experience is worse than one that is a roller coaster of quality, but I don't inherently agree. There are plenty of games that you would also say are like that, that I put above so many others. But it isn't an inherent truth that one level of quality or the other is just outright better. And I don't agree that Endwalker didn't have plenty of highs on the level of Heaven's Word, or even Shadowbringers. So even comparing the full package of story, Endwalker easily takes it for me. Though I mean again, I made my bias known. But look through the whole game and how much we've gone through to get to Endwalker. All the polishing, missteps, and successes. Endwalker's biggest failure is not reaching the same consistent highs as Shadowbringers while not doing enough different of its own. People want change, they want risks, and often they don't even know what they truly want. That's why parroting opinions ends up being so common. They can tell they're looking for something that the game isn't hitting, and there's nothing to do becomes the mantra I have read far too many times. There's lots to do, more than the darling that is Heaven's Word. The thing you should be saying is that there's nothing you want to do. Keep criticizing the game, that much is healthy, 
I myself put a lot of criticisms in this video, and in my disappointment in Endwalker not having a Eureka or a proper relic. But saying things that blatantly aren't true won't get the game to where you want it. If your problem is the 2 minute rotation, say that and explain why. Not just say the identity of your job is gone. Explain why, because as someone who doesn't religiously play your job, that lost its identity, it's the same as it was in Shadowbringers to me. Or in the case of, say, Summoner, kept its identity as a Summoner while being a different job. And that isn't because of the 2 minute meta. Having been thinking about making videos since Heavensward, and leveling everything to cap then, and actually doing it starting with Shadowbringers, I don't see that identity loss the same way you do. I'm just a happy little Dragoon main who has been happy with Dragoon since A Realm Reborn. We've not lost any identity, so explain it in a way I and everyone who doesn't see it will understand, not just pointing at timers. If when I ask why 2 minute rotations are bad and I constantly get it ruined the job identity and nothing else, I struggle to believe you because you can't tell me why. This other guy can, but you're just parroting him when you tell me, oh he did a talk. You can't explain it to me yourself. If you agreed so much, wouldn't you at least be able to say a little bit more than that? But of all the people I've actually been able to talk to about it and not just read or watch a video on, well they don't give me anything to go off of. You need to give me something, and then give that to the dev team through official sources. Take the time to make actionable feedback, something someone can understand beyond just a feeling you have, and give that feedback. Because if you are so upset at the loud minority casuals ruining your game, then maybe it's time to actually give proper feedback instead of blind anger. Even though most of the changes over the years have been due to high level players, the casuals didn't care. And Walker isn't the worst. A statement that somehow can be controversial in some circles because of people who just want to be angry or farm clicks. In some cases, both. But some of the stuff I've seen said after this fanfest, it's just been far too annoying for me not to hate write this. Endwalker has its problems. But maybe you really do just need a break. May the power of Anna did Hogsley waste to your enemies.